So have you seen the latest major debate economics, Paul Krugman himself? Now, if you are just, you know, catching up with this, let me bring you up to speed. So you had Krugman comment on one of Steve Keen's blog posts, and you can see uh, his post there on his New York Times column. Uh, and he questions and rejects some of what Keen is arguing in Minsky and methodology. And he warns us that it's wonkish. And I'll warn you, this is all a bit wonkish, but it is worth it to bear with us because, hey, you know, we had a major financial crisis, and the people who missed it, did not see it coming, are still the ones largely driving the economic debate forward with the same theories. And this applies to policymakers, too, from what I understand. So. Back to this, Keen responds defending his alternative approaches. You can see his post there. He notes that Paul Krugman has been commenting on his blog. So this continues. Some others weigh in with their two cents. Some more back and forth ensue. It gets a lot of buzz. It seems to end with a kind of an embarrassing, really, and at least slightly lazy seeming post where Krugman takes part of Keen's post out of context and then refutes it. He, he does it right here where he says that one of Keynes' points is all wrong, and that NK, which I believe stands for New Keynesian, models are all about sticky prices. So what is Keen saying? But what Krugman fails to recognize is that Keen had already just cleared up this point only slightly later in the post. I don't know if he read this far, but he said, so economists like Krugman, who describe themselves as New Keynesian, have tweaked the base case to derive models with sticky prices. So I know this is convoluted, but basically the point is that Keen had already cleared up what Krugman is criticizing, except Keen, of course, doesn't have the benefit of having all of New York Times readers see that. So. It's a little sticky there. Now, we spoke to economist and professor Steve Keen. He is also the author of Debunking Economics, The Naked Emperor Dethroned, to get the scoop on all of this and also what it means, bigger picture, for the fight against the economic establishment. Professor Keen, let me first just say thank you so much for being on the show. We are so happy to have you, not only because we think you're fantastic, but you have been involved in this blog brawl with Paul Krugman, New York Times writer, Nobel laureate, darling of the establishment uh, economic world. It really has just, I mean, it is all over the blogosphere. Now, I see banks, uh, endogenous and exogenous money, Minsky, New Keynesian, neoclassical models, a lot of this uh, stuff that maybe only a PhD econ uh, economist would really understand. So help us just first break down, really, what is the crux of the argument that you two have gotten into? Well, the crux of the argument is that I'm one of the group of non-conventional economists who argue you can't model the economy without including the role of banks, debt, and money. And Krugman's part of the economic establishment, which for 30 or 40 years uh, has got away with arguing you can model uh, a capitalist economy as if it has no banks in it, no money, and no debt. And we've been screaming for ages from the sidelines saying, hey, you can't do that. You just don't have a model of capitalism if you don't include those components. Along comes the financial crisis. Characters like me predicted it using models including money, banks and debt. And now Krugman comes along and says, oh, well, I can't see why you should actually bother having models of uh, banks, debt uh, and money uh, in macroeconomics. They're irrelevant. They don't matter to the macro economy, which, frankly, there's somebody like me and I hope most people in the real world gobsmack because, hey, we're living in the middle of a banking crisis caused by too much debt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so just to, to really hammer it home, what is that real major one sticking point that you guys are, are arguing about, that, that, that real sticking point? Well, the real sticking point is whether, uh, the, the, whether you can have a macroeconomic model of the economy that leaves out banking and debt. Mm -hmm. And Krugman argues that banking and debt is irrelevant to macroeconomics, which is frankly bizarre in the middle of the biggest financial crisis in history, where the behavior of banks is what gave us the crisis. So it's really that total battle that uh, he comes from the convention, the, the mainstream of economics, which has dominated it for, the, for 60 or 70 years, yeah. which argues that you can model the economy without talking about those issues, without debt and money. And I'm part of the minority, which has been progressively marginalized, that says you can't do it. So if we're 
finally getting the attention mm -hmm. of, of this crowd. They've been ignoring us for decades. Finally, they've taken us seriously. But then, of course, they dismiss our arguments. Well, you certainly are getting a lot of attention. And I'll tell you, one thing that, that this has escalated to is this final back and forth. You have Krugman. And, you know, this is something that I've seen you write about, a lot of people on the blogosphere write about, his commenters write about. It appears that he took part of your post out of context in a way that seems really disingenuous. What happened? Well, the type of model that Krugman works on, the models where they believe they can model the entire macro economy as if it's one blown up individual. And if you're really lucky, they make it two blown up individuals. And they, that's what they call the micro foundations approach to macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. Now, from my point of view, that's nonsense. You can't do it. And actually, the, the reasons why you can't are actually proven by very good conventional neoclassical economists. That simply doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but they, the people like Krugman have built the model ignoring these strong, well-founded theoretical criticisms of that whole approach. And in general, I just think it's a bit like a bunch of Ptolemaic astronomers who model the universe as if the Earth is in the center and the planets and the suns revolve around us. And the way they explain the fact that planets occasionally reverse directions is whacking epicycles on top of it. And one bunch has got one set of epicycles another has another bunch, they're still all assuming the Earth is the centre of the universe. Mm -hmm. So to me, I just use a label calling them dynamics. They, they have a, one particular label, they call themselves DSGE, which stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. Mm -hmm. And I simply said, these models start off by assuming all motion is circular, mm -hmm. a bit like the Ptolemyans. And then two paragraphs down, I said, because this can't possibly match reality, just like the Ptolemaic astronomers added on planets going on epicycles so they could explain reversal of direction, people like Krugman, I'll actually mention him by name, mm -hmm. add in frictions, uh, slow re reaction of prices, sticky, sticky wages, uh, uh, downwardly inflexible wages, etc., etc. Now, he obviously didn't read the post, mm -hmm. simply saw the start where I talked about the, the circular motion part of the model mm -hmm. and then assumed that I, that I didn't know that the rest was done, as if I'm some dunce who doesn't know the economic literature. Yeah. Now, the frank thing is I know the economic literature better than Krugman does. Well, and... And the, the, the insult was, was, yeah, I got insulted by being in front of a million readers of the New York Times by somebody who misread my paper. Right. Well, you know, a lot of his commenters, though, pointed that out and pointed out that he took you out of context to make his point. And then he said, and we can bring it up, he gave updates to that post and said, uh, essentially, time to move on. We're done. Uh, this is it. And uh, we have it right there. He went on to sound like he essentially called you a heretic. At least he said, I'm all for listening to heretics, but blah, blah, blah. So I guess my question, is this a Paul Krugman personality thing, do you think? Or is this more representative of how neoclassical economists think that they need to be right even when they're wrong? It's more that neoclassicals think they're right no matter what. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, they have a vision of the economy that has it in equilibrium or nearby, uh, disturbed a bit from equilibrium by shocks, and all the ups and downs are just these exogenous shocks. And we've been saying for a long, long time, you can't model the economy as if it's in equilibrium because, hey, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's out of equilibrium, and especially at times right, right now. So there's, there's other approaches to do it, dynamic modeling that I do, mm -hmm. that give you models that include banks that actually give you the result that, yes, you can have crises like the one we're in now. And I first wrote a model of that nature back in 1995. Now, Krugman, has, they've always ignored us. And this, what they've simply said is, oh, you don't understand our models, therefore we can ignore you. Mm -hmm. Which is a bit like a Ptolemaic astronomer saying to Galileo, you don't understand how my particular bunch of, 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 of circle models, therefore I can ignore you. Mm -hmm. But Galileo is saying, hey, your tables are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. People can't navigate the Mediterranean anymore because your tables have, have lost relevance. There's something wrong with the core of your model. Mm -hmm. In my case, I'm saying, Paul, if your models were right, we wouldn't be in a financial crisis. There you go. Uh, that was economist, professor, and author Steve Keen. We'll have more with him after the break. And still ahead, Warren Buffett may have started out as a newspaper boy in the 40s. But now it seems a billionaire investor is trying to play up those roots, making headlines for it as well. We'll give you our three cents. But first, your closing market numbers.
We just put a picture of me when I was like nine years old on to tell the truth. confession i am a total ghetto princess i love rap and hip-hop music and christian music i thought he was kind of a dick yesterday i'm very proud of the role that al jazeera has played You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. What drives the world? The fear-mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State-controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT, question more. Welcome back. So we are trying to break through the conventional mainstream economic wisdom. That's what we're talking about right now. This recent battle we've seen Krugman and Keene have been duking it out. That's recently on the pages of their blogs. But you may recall that it was mainstream economists who largely missed the financial crisis of 2008 in the first place. Okay, didn't see it coming. And remember, this article from Krugman himself at right around that time, he asked, how did economists get it so wrong? He points out few economists saw our current crisis coming. More important was the profession's blindness to the very possibility of catastrophic failures in a market economy. Yet catastrophic they were nonetheless. People did predict them, okay, just maybe not those that are writing articles like that, okay? And according to Keene and many others, not much has changed with traditional economics, with neoclassical economics, and with its failures uh, that are still considered status quo. So I followed up with economist and professor Steve Keene, who I should point out, and he said it earlier, did see and predict the financial crisis coming well ahead of time. And you said neoclassical economists don't want to listen. So what does that say about the people whose opinions are still considered the holy grail, even though they miss the financial crisis, continue to miss things, uh, and yet this is, you know, considered conventional wisdom? Yeah, and they, they, we are really listening to people we should not be listening to anymore because the one thing their theory predicted was you couldn't have an enormous long-running long downturn precisely like the one we're in now. And he also says, and this is the part that I find quite most outrageous, that the level of debt and the, the rate of change of private debt doesn't matter. Well, if you do a graph, and you've seen me do this before, mm -hmm. of the ratio of private debt to income in America to GDP, you get one enormous peak in the Great Depression, then a decline uh, through the Great Depression. Another a rise from low levels of debt up to high levels of debt right now, and then another fall. The only, the, so, so the two depressions we've had in the last century mm -hmm. have both been coincident with rising levels of debt to GDP. Mm -hmm. Now he's saying, oh, that's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. Of course, on my uh, logical deductive reasoning front, the level of debt doesn't matter. Therefore, they can't possibly cause a depression. Two of the last two depressions have had debt bubbles. Mm -hmm. They're just denying the... It's as if you've got a model of, you know, circular motion of the planets, and we've just had a collision with a huge meteor that they claim can't happen, and they're denying that it matters. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they really are anti-empirical, and it's time we push them off the stage. Uh, well, and this maybe brings me to my next question. Our, many of our viewers may know this because they pay attention to the blogosphere and read a lot of the blogs that are popular, uh, economic mm -hmm. blogs. But those that don't, this has become a really big deal. I've seen people all over the blogosphere writing about this conversation and this back and forth between you and Krugman and a few others that are peppered in there. Why do you think this has gotten so much buzz? 
Well, I think it's a pretty good start when you get uh, somebody talking about your work in the New York Times and then expressing incredulity and then making the mistake of engaging in a discussion afterwards because uh, so Krugman actually set it up by replying to me. But what it then exposed, it was, it's finally the beginnings of a debate. Because you'd imagine, if you're outside of economics, that if there's competing views into how the economy operates within economics, then surely there are regular debates. The reality is, no, the neoclassicals ignore people like me who are critical. So once you suddenly get one of the neoclassicals acknowledging that we even exist, mm -hmm. suddenly, bang, mm -hmm. it causes an explosion of discussion right across the blog sphere. Mm -hmm. And normally they come back is you don't understand our models, therefore we can ignore you. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, hey, your models didn't predict, predict the financial crisis. We can ignore your models. Mm -hmm. And so, that, that is a big shift. So that's a big shift. So I know you have said in the past that neoclassical economics is going to uh, end or change literally one funeral at a time. Are you saying, though, that this actually is yep. starting to advance the conversation in a way that is material? And we just have a minute here. I think it's the beginning of it. It's, it's people here certainly outside are now realizing that they can't leave economics to the economists. And when they look inside it and see how unrealistic the mainstream are, and see people like myself and the, the MMT crowd as well, from the post Keynesian position, and even Austrians, they're saying, hey, maybe the people who have been marginalized make, make more sense than the mainstream does. It's time we supported them. So maybe we can break down the neoclassical citadel, citadel from the outside with the help of the public. Well, maybe it looks like this, uh, this blog brawl has started to uh, show some cracks, which is really refreshing to see. And we really appreciate you being on the show to tell us about it, Professor Keene, firsthand in the trenches, fighting the good fight. We have your superhero doppelganger, or we did, uh, behind us before this. And uh, it's nice to see you in London. <laughs> Thank yeah. you.